channel is all about partnerships and all about trust and relationships. And that comes down to people. I can put the best program in place, but if my people don't have the relationships or my people are not trustworthy or I'm not trustworthy or, you know, my upper management doesn't support the channel program and they are not trustworthy, the program's going to fail. And, um, you know, we've proven here, we've quadrupled our results year over year and we're on pace to do it again this year. So um, it's because we communicate very well and, and the people that are on my team are trustworthy. Uh, integrity is huge with me, trust and integrity in the program itself. And I'm fortunate my upper management, our CRO, Chris Conley and our CEO, Spencer Mully are very supportive of channel and they will get on the phone all day long with a channel partner um, that hasn't, you know, typically it's the larger opportunities. They'll get on the phone with them though. Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning into Channel Voices, the podcast for future channel leaders, where we learn the ins and outs of partner ecosystems through casual conversations with channel professionals from a variety of industries, partner types, and geographies. My name is Maciek, and I'm your host. Monica Walton, welcome to Channel Voices. Thank you, Magic. How are you? I'm very good, and thank you so much for coming on to the show. It would be great if you wouldn't mind just tell us who you are, a little bit about yourself, and maybe your channel background as well, please. Sure, sure. So I'm Monica Walton. I'm Senior Vice President of Channel at Evoke, which is a data center solution company. Uh, we're based out of Dallas, but I'm actually physically based in Denver, Colorado. So uh, I've been with the company about coming up on three years and um, was hired to actually run the channel program. But my whole background, my entire career has been in the telecom space. So I've spent 12 years at Sprint, five years at COVAD, not COVID, COVAD, which was a DSL uh, startup company. And then uh, the last 15 years at CenturyLink, which is now Lumen and um, had the opportunity um, to do something different and came to Evoke almost three years ago to run the channel program. And have you had much channel experience before you came to Evoke? My background's a little interesting to be running channel because my background has been all in the direct space, running salespeople that you know competed and sold directly to enterprise customers. And at points, in time, I was actually, my team was uh, selling against channel. So that was probably my first foray into, into channel was to, you know, be competing against a channel partner. And that was the program at the time, you know, incented us to be very separate, um, which is not how I run my program today, by the way. You know, that was my start of, of working with channel. And then I actually had an opportunity to be a chief of staff for one of the executives at um, at the time, it was level three, which became CenturyLink, which became Lumen. And uh, it was an opportunity to learn kind of more behind the scenes of how channel works. And I was the, in charge of biz ops, so the support backside of, of channel as well to make sure that the program ran well. That was a unique opportunity to really learn from some elite leaders in the channel program and you know really understand why they were doing things the way they were. And I use that to meld into how I run my program today. Right. Very good. Thank you for, for that introduction. How did you find the transition from being in the direct sales, competing with channel, and going into a role where you actually are leading the channel strategy? For me, um, I think it was the word I would use would be as a natural transition. So my background, as I mentioned, is all direct sales, right? But I understand the sales process. I understand enterprise business customers, anywhere from small all the way up to I was on site three years with one of the top three banks. So, you know, I've, I've managed small to very large enterprise customers. So I understand the process and I use those skills to apply it. So, you know, when I'm talking to channel partners, I understand what they're going through because I've been through that. 
So I really melded all of that background into how I developed the program for my channel program here at Evoke. And when you joined Evoke, was there already a channel strategy? Was there a channel program there or were you hired to start the channel? So there was a program started. Evoke is only about five years old. And uh, we started when AT&T spun off their data centers. That was the start of Evoke. And there was a channel program that was started. But to be honest, it was, you know, you can imagine back then it was a startup company. And their mantra was to get as many channel partners signed up as possible. And so I came in about a year and a half into it. And it was not the direction I would have taken it. So my first week in the role, I actually interviewed and and met with all of the leaders at Evoke in Dallas and just asked them what's going well, what's not going well as far as channel. And I think back then, maybe seven to 9% of sales were coming from channel. And my goal at the time was to bump that up to 30 very quickly. From that perspective, I interviewed everybody my first week and I it allowed me to really quickly see where the gaps were. So I, by the end of the first week, then I outlined, here's the structure of what I think we should have for our channel program. I ran it by our CEO, got his buy-in, and that was the, the core backbone of our program. From that point forward, then I started, you, you know, when you come into a program, you want to make it your own. That's what I did. Started assessing first the team, the program itself, what pillars we were going to focus on. And then took it from there and grew it. What was it like to inherit a program, but then also so quickly making decisions to change certain things, right? Or improve certain things. What was the reception like in the business? Was it hard to get your ideas through or were people very receptive to the new approach, the Monica approach? I think people were very receptive. I I have found the channel to be very open arms. And, you know, they have, I've been now working with channel people for roughly like probably the last seven or eight years. I don't have 30 years of channel direct relationships, right? But they've been, everybody that I've met has been wonderful to work with. And um, as long as you approach things, you know, very common sense oriented and what that you think they would expect, things go very well. So, um, but I think one of the first things I saw was responsiveness. And so I focused my team. And by the way, I had to bring in a new team um, that had the experience and the professionalism that I was expecting for my team. And the number one thing I drove into their heads is when an elite comes in, we have to be responsive. We put in a process where we would register the lead We would reach out to the sales organization. We have rules of engagement. So based on size, we know exactly where to send that to. And that sales rep knows when they get a channel lead at Evoke, they need to be reaching out to the channel partner within hours. So usually we offer same day service as far as lead registration and response. Sometimes, you know, many times it's within hours. So that was a number one differentiator that we instigated. Number two is I've learned with channel partners, don't mess with their money. <laughs> so <laughs> so we um, spent a lot of time just going through all of our uh, channel commissions, making sure we were auditing, making sure they were accurate. A lot of times we were finding things that were um, missing commissions and we actually went back and paid them. That also earned a lot of brownie points, if you will, and respect or trust. That was the other thing. I was trying to build trust with our program because- For sure integrity to me is is huge. So I want to make sure if we're running a program, it's it's a program that they can trust because they're bringing us in to meet with their customers, right? So you want to make sure you're doing a good job with that and being responsive and and then ultimately paying them accurately. And then the the big the other big thing that I cleaned up was as I mentioned earlier, they were just trying to sign on as many channel partners as possible because that was their mantra, get the name yeah. out, right? I flipped that and we went from, you know, the good old 80-20 rule. So we had over 150 partners signed up and we now typically work with about 25. 
Okay. So, and we're much more successful because we're giving that level of service that those 25 partners really expect and need. I see that quite a bit that when a startup is, thinks that they're ready to go and have a channel motion, the indirect sales motion, mm -hmm. they typically grab every single partner that they can just to get their name out there, get their own logo on a partner's website and all that good stuff, right? Right. But then can you actually scale it, right? Because when you are starting a channel program from scratch, you probably don't have a team of, you know, 20 people that will be able to look after those partners on a daily basis, right? right. right. And then you go and you sign up partners in the 100 plus, that very quickly might have a negative impact in terms of the brand because out of a sudden you're not able to service all those partners on time. Mm -hmm. Delays happen. Trust is undermined then and it can have really negative impact overall on the on the business. I am very happy to hear that that's something that, you know, someone mainly direct sales experience has quickly recognized that that isn't necessarily the best the best thing to do. We need to look at the partners we have possibly reevaluate them and work with the ones that where it really makes sense for both parties. Right? Correct. Yeah. Not just for one. It's not just for a vendor to get the logo out there. Mm -hmm. This is a partnership. It should be it should be mutual partnership, it not should. just one way, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I actually we we pulled recently, we pulled that long list and, and for the last two years. I've, the ones that, you know, were signed up, but never did anything with us. I've just kind of ignored the them, but we actually recently just sent them notice to say, look, you know, this is a two-way partnership. We haven't talked to you or heard from you in two years. So let's, let's part ways. And it allowed us to really just focus on the channel partners that do want to partner. And you know, we, we have made a concerted effort to make sure that we work with the master agents as well, the TSDs that are out there, because they have the, the scope or the bandwidth of, you know, the, the luxury of having multiple agents under them, right? So yeah. um, span of control is greater there. So we, we work with most of the larger master agents out there, as well as some larger direct agents as well. But if somebody new comes in now to my program, and they're a single agent, we actually encourage them to sign up under a master because it just makes sense for us. I have a small team and a very, very senior team, a very experienced with relationships, but it's a small team. We can't be everywhere and give good service. So their jobs are to educate the channel partners on Evoke, what's new, what spiffs do we have out there, what promos we have out there and really be in front of these channel partners um, as much as possible. So it makes sense to have that audience more targeted um, so that we can be more effective for them. And going back to the team. So when you, in, you inherited a program, there must mm -hmm. have been some sort of a team in mm -hmm. place, but you did say that you needed to build a team. So, so you recognized certain things that needed to be changed in the channel program did you also recognize some needs for change on the team? And that's why you decided to build the new team? Or is it a mixture of both, a little bit of the old and some new people as well? Actually, at this point in time, I have changed over the entire team. So okay. it's hard, you know, when you come in, you know, you're dealing with people, right? And you want to be very cognizant that this is their job. But you also want to make sure that the team that you're inheriting is on the same page with you and will meet the expectations of what you're driving uh, for your program. And through time, I got to know the existing team and whether it's just, you know, through time that I set the expectations and they were, weren't able to achieve those, we quickly worked through that. So within about six months, I was able to bring in people that I trusted that had, you know, 20 plus years of relationships within the channel 
because, you know, I'm a leader and I didn't have the 20 plus years of relationships. I had 20 plus years of knowing how to run a program, knowing how to run a sales organization. And I applied those skills and where I was a little bit, you, I, I always believe as a leader, if you're weak in some spot, that's where you, you know, you bring your team in to, to fulfill where you might be not, you know, as experienced. So that's what I did. I brought in two channel directors that I knew, didn't know them that well, but I knew they had the experience. And the three of us sat down and that's how we started our program. And I think I mentioned earlier, you know, initially when I came in, seven to nine percent of our sales at Evoke were coming from the channel program. Mm -hmm. Last last quarter, we're now at 60. So wow. it's been a huge, massive sh shift, I should say, um, over the last two years. And it's because of, you know, all the things we've been talking about, focusing on the top 25 data set or data center focused channel partners, bringing in people that are experienced and have the relationships that can pick up the phone and quickly, you know, identify opportunities. So it's, it's worked very well so far. And um, of course, my upper management wants me to do even more. So we'll see what we can do <laughs> as we go into 2024. Very good. That's very impressive results in such a short time period. And for Thank such you. a young company. We spoke about those changes that you have applied. You mentioned filtering the partners when you, when you came in because there was a hundred plus. We talked a little bit about the team, what changes you made there. What was the change, if you can put a finger on it, which one change that you have implemented drove that success? I personally think it's the people. Uh, the people that I have on my team and, and I'll be honest, this year I lost one person on my team. And that happens. You always have to keep a bench warm. And to be honest, we were able to replace that person very quickly with somebody who was just almost as experienced. So um, we didn't skip a beat, which was good. And But you also, as a leader, you have to anticipate that there may be some turnover. And it's unfortunate because when somebody leaves, you know, if they're doing a great job, it's a big loss, right? Um, but I was fortunate I was able to backfill that very quickly. So to me, it's the people. Channel channel is all about partnerships and all about trust and relationships. And that comes down to people. I can put the best program in place, but if my people don't have the relationships or my people are not trustworthy or I'm not trustworthy or you know my upper management doesn't support the channel program and they are not trustworthy, the program's going to fail. And, um, you know, we've proven here, we've quadrupled our results year over year, and we're on pace to do it again this year. So um, it's because we communicate very well, and, and the people that are on my team are trustworthy. Uh, integrity is huge with me, trust and integrity in the program itself. And I'm fortunate my upper management, our CRO, Chris Conley, and our CEO, Spencer Mully, are very supportive of channel and they will get on the phone all day long with a channel partner um, that hasn't, you know, typically it's the larger opportunities. They'll get on the phone with them though. And uh, we will give that level of support to show our, you know, our commitment to the channel program. That's great to hear. Obviously that support from sea level is so important when it comes to channel. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they hold the key to a lot of things that you would like to do, and you need them to be to be behind you and recognize the opportunity that's out there. If if you were if they were to say yes to certain things, right? Right. So it's very important. So you talked about the revenue increase in terms of percentage, indirect versus direct, and how you quadrupled it year on year. How? else do you measure your partner's performance today? So we named our program Accelerate and we have these Accelerate Awards. So quarterly, we recognize the top two or three, we'll say. Um, it's, uh, we look at the results and if there's you know two that just really killed it and the next one is further down, then we'll just do two awards. But uh, we measure that based on total contract value so and sales. So that's our initial one. And so a, a channel partner to win the award, they might be the top uh, leads that came in converted to sales based on total contract value. So that's the initial one. 
Um, where I'm really focused now is it's been interesting in the market. We're seeing a huge shift in the market over the last, say, three to six months with artificial intelligence, AI really hitting the market strong, especially in data center business. They're looking for large amounts of capacity, space and power. And so it's interesting, like last year, we would see a handful of large multi-megawatt opportunities. Mm -hmm. This year, we have them coming out our ears. <laughs> so um, from that perspective, it's been um, a really big shift in the market. And so, you know, having that support that I talked about earlier with our CEO and our CRO, I think, I think that's a little bit unusual for a provider, service provider like us to be able to say, hey, if you bring an opportunity in and it's a larger one, we're going to have our CEO on the very first call or our CRO on the very first call with you in partnership. Let's talk to the customer and let's identify. And if the deal can be made, uh, we will find a way to make it happen. So that's the level of support that, that we bring. So am I right in understanding that you co-sell with partners rather than let partners sell on their own, or is it a mixture of both? It's a flexibility, I guess, okay. is, is the word I would use. We let the partner tell us how they want to work. Eventually, we want to talk to the customer, but the partner, if they're bringing their customer to us and it's a lead, we're not going to disrupt that partnership that they already have built with their end user mm -hmm. customers. So we will let them Tell us, how do, how do you want to work with that end user customer, whether it's arm in arm or through the channel partner, and then they talk to the customer. But eventually, we do like to talk to the customer ourselves. And then as far as um, another KPI, I wanted to circle back on that. Where I'm really focused right now is with that market shift of going too large. We've really seen the smaller business, which I think is meat and potatoes. It's it's a transactional business, say 100 kilowatt and less. That sort of business has really um, slowed down. So I think everybody's so excited about these big deals, but they're not as focused on the smaller business. And I don't want to lose sight of that. So um, we are working to try and actually incent uh, the agents to bring us more of the smaller deals as well, because if you can imagine you have a data center and you have these bigger chunks going away, well, guess what? You have these smaller chunks in between and you can Tetris that by yeah. bringing in small customers, you know, single one, five, 10 cabinet type deals to just put them in place in the little gaps in the data center. So we, we continue to have opportunities there as well. So from a KPI perspective, I'm, I'm leaning towards some sort of promotion contest. I don't know yet. We're working on that. But we would like to incent them to really don't lose sight of the of the small biz as well. Yeah, that's perfect. So I was going to ask if you measure partner also on the new logos that they bring, right? I'm sure they expand the existing install base and everything else. Mm -hmm. They do. It's very easy to lose sight of the small things because everybody wants to land that whale, right? Right. Everybody yeah. wants to reel that one in and be the hero. Yeah. But then there's all the other stuff, which is really the baseline that keeps the lights on of a company. And it has to be trickling through regularly. Right. So, yeah, I see that. I see that a lot that partners might be incented on new logo wins, regardless of the value of, mm -hmm. of the actual deal. Of course, there are targets when it comes to TCV, ACV, however you measure it. But it is important to bring in multiple customers in the quarter rather than just one large one, right? Right, right. You also have the op opportunity to to expand the smaller ones, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's um, that's how it works. Land and expand is very is a very common uh, common model that works for majority of of companies in in the tech business. Right, exactly. Um, we actually just recently rolled out a spiff that you know, does incent for new logos. So um, I won't give the specifics here, but if, if somebody's interested, have them reach out to me because uh, we do want to not lose sight of growing new business. Um, it's always easier, I think, to sell to existing customers versus landing that new logo. But 
you know, that's critical to continue to grow your business, whether it's a small customer or that big whale, like you mentioned. Yeah. And I'm just thinking the changes that you have implemented and where you are now, have you measured the impact it had on the cost of sale? Because having only single digits going through channel versus 90% coming in direct, I mean, that has to be a big enough direct team making a lot of phone calls to big and small potential customers. And now all of a sudden, you do have partners that go and do that on your behalf, pretty mm -hmm. much, right? Obviously, you do jump on the calls where a partner needs you to jump on, but it must have a huge impact on the cost of sale for, for a company like Evoke. Yeah, I uh, work with our finance department and uh, just recently they, as a matter of fact, it's funny you ask that because uh, we just got a EBITDA updated report on channel and all I'll say is channel is very healthy. So um, from that perspective, yes, we do look at that um, in comparison. And so uh, as I mentioned earlier, our CEO would love for me to drive more and more business uh, from channel. So uh, we do measure that, though, because I think it's important to consider all of the costs both ways and um, really look at that to determine, you know, where it makes sense and where you go through your support for the company as well. Fantastic. This is a question I ask of every single guest. I think you know it's coming. But <laughs> Monica, what's the one thing you wish you knew before you started your career in channel? I would probably say I wish I would have started it sooner. <laughs> um, that's probably the biggest thing is, uh, I love, I have loved, um, you know, even though my time in channel has been shorter than a lot of people in channel, I've loved it. I, I really enjoy working with the various channel, um, personalities out there, if you will. And, uh, running this program has been challenging. It has been fun. It's been exciting. We've had some big wins. I wished I would have done this years ago. And um, I don't know, who knows, maybe to the point down the road that I would have had my own channel program, um, you know, or my own agency, who knows. But I also think that the experience that I had gives me a unique perspective coming into this because I am, you know, a little bit newer into the channel program, but with my background being from the chief of staff, so having that inside track of learning and then the 20 plus years of selling direct, I think I bring a unique perspective to the role and probably a fresh perspective too. And everybody in, in channel has been open arms, uh, really have enjoyed building some relationships with some key people throughout and they're wonderful to work with. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. I heard that one before from some people. I wish I started earlier than that. But in, in your case, I mean, this is backed up by a lot of evidence and the successes that you're that you're having at Evoke right now. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experience and your expertise with us. And we wish you continued success with Evoke. And let's see, can you bring it to 80 next year? Oh. To 80%? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what you've been asked yet, but... <laughs> Yeah, don't don't talk to my CEO about that, please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I appreciate it. Um, we're going to continue to grow here at Evoke, and I appreciate um, spending the time with me to you know understand the program and what we're trying to accomplish here. And and I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you. And that's a wrap for this episode. I do hope you found it valuable, and if you did please make sure to subscribe and leave a review. You can also follow Channel Voices podcast on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook. Or just visit channelvoices.com where you can send me a message or leave a voicemail. All of the links are listed in the show notes. And once again, I appreciate you tuning in today. Until next time.